Until the release of King of the Delta, blues singers, Robert Johnson and country blues in general, was one of these largely forgotten presences. So today the Johnson cult reinstates the same kind of individualist, unique artistic genius discourse that left him in obscurity for so long. His recording was done on the last demonstrated controlled, deliberate, and thoroughly innovative use of certain production techniques of particular relevance to the study of fabricating space in popular music, in American popular music. I think that most uh, who listen to Robert Johnson and who look at his work find evidence of, there, there are two approaches to Robert Johnson. One approach is to undermine Robert Johnson as a significant individual. Scholars need jobs, they need something to do. Publishers need books uh, uh, in, in the marketplace, even today, uh, wherever possible. And the authenticity wars have all to do with the myriad of books on Robert Johnson. There are some written by um, uh, people who, who, who really want to want to take away the uh, persona of Robert Johnson. So therefore, rightfully so, find origins to all of his songs uh, in Pee Wee Strauss, Scrapper Blackwell, so many other uh, artists uh, that he uh, was able to, um, uh, because folk music works that way, uh, grab, steal, uh, reconstruct. But we have to keep in mind, as I read these books, as I, as I must, and enjoy them immensely and learn phenomenally from them, I realized that when I first heard Robert Johnson on a 7 8 RPM, I had no idea there was anything before him. Um, that would be in the 50s, not the 60s. Um, and so even, I would say, within the last decade, um, we're still learning about Robert Johnson. Robert Johnson would never have imagined a huge article in Vanity Fair not that long ago, I think it was last year, about a third photograph of him that purportedly had shown up. Matt Humanoff, who runs, a friend of mine who runs Humanoff Guitars in New York City, I think one of the oldest and most venerable guitar shops in the world, uh, well, it was one of his employees that uh, secured the photo. I believe, if I remember correctly, it was a um, kind of a fluke. Uh, it was not known to be Robert Johnson, and there's argument to this day it's now being subjected to forensic science. Well, that's interesting. I think that it should be subjected to forensic science, and if it's the third photo of Robert Johnson, I'd like to see it. I don't want to own it, but I'd like to take a look. Well, I already have seen it. It was public in kind of fair. Um, but it was published not in defiance of copyright because it may or may not be written securely controlled at this point in time. Um, there was a fleeting moment of film of Robert Johnson, uh, purported to be Robert Johnson. It was you know, really interesting. To the casual observer, it could have been him. Yeah, I just watched it maybe a hundred times. <laughs> Doesn't look like the face of a t-shirt. Is that you? Um, uh, it, you know, it really looks like him. But it, forensic science has proven it's not uh, with their laboratory uh, computer technology, measuring facial bones and so forth and so on. Well, you know. <laughs> So the third, the third image of Robert Johnson does not exist. There are two. If any of you are interested, I have one of them in my office. It's on a poster <laughs> from a long time ago that may or may not still be available because copyrights are now settled regarding this image. But uh, we are, we have this phenomenal interest in Robert Johnson, as we should, as we should, because this artist is very different. This artist is very different, and uh, considerably so, and we need to find out why. 
it, very, very different uh, than uh, Lightning Mountains, than Mississippi Fred McDowell, than so many others, than even Skip James, uh, than even Sun House. People who I, I think who are educated regarding uh, the authenticity of a certain sound would uh, not debate as being uh, as prominent as Robert Johnson, but Robert Johnson captured something that has all to do with the space that sound occupies. Now, you know, Robert Johnson and all of these scholastic works, uh, whether they're um, um, in Search of Robert Johnson, uh, to quote the title of a very good documentary, um, or In Search of, let's be scientific about this, uh, his famous song about going down to the crossroad, in which he never says he trades his soul uh, to the devil in order to play differently than others at the time. Um, well, you know, many books are written on where he was during that two-week period, or surmising where he was, as opposed to having apparently been stuck at the crossroads for a very long time, uh, learning how to play guitar all over again. I'll tell the Robert Johnson story later, but there's a lot that you can look into regarding Robert Johnson. It's very amusing, especially the stuff that actually seeks to refute that he didn't cut a deal with the devil. There are, there are at least two books that refute that this was possible. <laughs> All right? And um, I've read these books over and over and over and over and over again because I just am always enthralled with people who go after something uh, so meticulously that uh, actually is displacing it from its proper category. It's not whether he had to deal with the devil or not. Um, it's something else. It's why we uh, uh, still carry that man, uh, along with us. And we do. Um, so if you come across one of those books, uh, or the play about Robert Johnson, uh, I'm sure the Vanity Fair article is online. I, I think it would be fun for you to just enter the world of who is Robert Johnson, uh, not as scholars, but uh, you know, as people hunting, hunting for gossip tidbits, and to start to build up, if, please, if you would, um, if you haven't already, if you have, well, then there'll be a sign in here about two days ahead. Uh, just, just try to figure out who this guy, why is this, this, this man so important to us? And keep in mind that uh, it really was, uh, I'll give you a history of Robert Johnson later on, but keep in mind that it was his, it really was his record so accurately, his 33 and third RPM record so accurately described uh, as changing music forever, uh, really during uh, its issuance. Columbia happened to own the masters, not knowing they did, and John Hammond, being the genius that he was, thought, give it a shot. And lo and behold, volume two shows up soon. There's a slow burn for three decades. And then there's the box set, which is meticulous. And then by day, interestingly enough, interestingly enough, there are so many versions of uh, Robert Johnson recordings that it's virtually impossible. Uh, if one were a collector of artifacts, it would be fun to collect all of the Robert Johnson recordings. Uh, I, I, yes, I admit to a little OCD behavior. I've got, you know, probably 10 or 12, some of which repeat songs, well, most of which repeat songs, except for one that has a lost track. Um, um, a master differently and or just simply from the 78s and so you know, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. But what's interesting to me is that there are so many suckers. There are so many people who uh, uh, are uh, picking up on Robert Johnson uh, in uh, this album or that album. Well, here are these types of songs from him. Here's a different collection arranged differently and uh, so forth with 
do liner notes. And then we have all of the albums that are tributes to Robert Johnson, the worst being Me and Mr. Johnson by Eric Clapton. <laughs> Um, it's uh, tantamount to uh, Itsy Weeny, Teeny Weeny, Yellow Polka Dog Bikini. It's one of those novelty songs, in this case, uh, uh, one of these novelty albums, sort of like Purple People Eater, Chevrolet's Great Hit. Um, it's one of these uh, attempts at playing Robert Johnson that is out of respect. And sure, I wish I could really play guitar that well, but it has nothing to do with Robert Johnson's sound, feel touch. I think that, uh, um, like as we were uh, discussing, I think last week, um, the uh, um, these songs that are dealing with death, um, I think that uh, Robert Johnson, in um, he's like, not only like uh, uh, preaching about that archetype of, of, uh, of the shadow, but he's like, uh, in our consciousness, he's living it. Or lived it, and uh, um, I think that we can hear the shade in his music. Yep, there's a wonder. Yep, you've said two things. There's a wonderful book called uh, "I Shot a Man in Reno." Is the full title just to watch him die, and then yep. there's a title yep. that's about that long, about right. murder and death and mayhem and so forth and so on and how obsessed we are, and actually how, uh, although the book is clear on this, I am, uh, we have an entire uh, idiom of music, uh, an entire musical idiom that doesn't exist, all that country, based on disaster. Well, well, as we move forward in the class, we'll talk about it. But, yeah, absolutely, right. This sense of foreboding and, uh, can I just be poetic? A graveyard at night uh, is in, uh, the Robert Johnson lyricism. It's in the very uh, spookified, spookified guitar work. Um, it, there's something very spooky about what he plays that um, uh, it, 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 forgive me, it's a sonic meta text uh, regarding uh, mean death. Um, so, you, yeah, you're absolutely right. As with other artists during different eras, uh, no matter what the derivations are, he captures an archetype in a way that no one else could. So, you've talked about performance and content as the same thing, and then in another subject category is how did he make these recordings? Because that has a lot to do with how um, we take the sound. If they were made differently, if you weren't as brilliant, Robert Johnson, if you if you if he hadn't been as brilliant when he made the recordings, we wouldn't we probably still have the same impact, but it's really uh, severely reinforced. It's not only there, but um, it's it's there in, in, in a different spatial con construct. In the bathroom. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Reverb, echo. What, what what does that mean? Yeah. I kind of wonder what. Uh, I, I mean, with, you know, when I heard Robert Johnson, I heard the, the story first, and then heard the music, and then it was kind of like when, as I was hearing the music, it was kind of like the feeling of like when I was a kid. You heard the story first, and then the music. Yeah, and then that's was, interesting. I need to talk to you. Because it, it, it actually, because then when, once I was hearing the music, it was almost like hearing you know like old Iron Maiden albums when I was a kid or something, where it had that uh, that kind of spookiness and the story behind it, or is this actually coming from the devil kind of thing? Talk about cultural identifiers, and I think that um, th there is something about um, the um, metallic quality of death that um, has all to do with uh, what you're hearing in Robert Johnson. That's interesting that you heard it, uh, that, that you uh, heard the music, you said after the story, right? Yeah, in a small town. Yeah, well, right, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, um, I think to go along with that, like if you're, um, uh, if you view the devil as um, uh, the, the shadow side of, yes. the, of the self, 
Yes. Um, I think <coughs> like the intrigue for me is that I am hearing the devil. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because, because this person is like um, has completely embodied, and I think completely subconsciously embodied um, the shadow side. And we can prove that he self-consciously embodied the shadow side because we can describe the recording sessions and what he did, all right? Otherwise, I wouldn't go there. Mm -hmm.